This is the current federal tax developments for the week of August the 8th, 2022. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers, and we're going to talk this week about some of the things that have been going on in the area of federal taxes. And first, I'm recording this now later on Sunday, uh, because I was watching to make sure I had information about what happened this weekend. But as of today, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, did pass the Senate on, as expected, a 51-50 vote. And we'll talk a little bit about where that stands, also what the House is likely to do with it this week. Next up, we'll talk about the fact that the IRS released inflation-adjusted premium tax credit percentages for 2023. Now, a good chunk of this may be rendered irrelevant by the uh, tax bill, assuming the House passes it, and at least and they and the Senate agree on the same form, so the president signs it. If that happens, then we are going to get an extension of what we've had in terms of a, if, let's say, greatly expanded premium tax credit and lower percentages that we've had the past couple of years. But otherwise, we will talk about what those things are, because until a bill is across the finish line, never believe a bill's law. Put it that way always. We also have the IRS this week release the draft form 1040, and that draft form 1040 has a new question, revised question on digital assets. And so we'll talk a little bit about what's there, what they're asking, why they change it, and what we're doing going forward. We have a court case because alimony is still an issue because, again, we have clients that got divorced before 2019 with payments still being made between the spouses. Here, the fact that the agreement was not clear on whether something was or was not alimony, well, it turned out badly for the taxpayer who paid it because, in the end, the Eighth Circuit agreed with the tax court that the $51 million paid by this taxpayer was not alimony and while his former spouse is very happy about that because, you know, paying taxes on $51 million of ordinary income is kind of a downer, uh, he's not really happy because losing a deduction that's ordinary of $51,000 is also kind of a downer. So we'll talk about why it was blown and, uh, you know, how that worked out. And finally, th- this just made official something that we had known about, we've been actually doing since 2017, but now it has become permanent. The IRS did finally adopt as final regulations the proposed regulations issued in 2017 for which taxpayers were able to basically rely on them prior to being finalized. That got rid of the requirement to get a wet signature on a 754 election made by a partnership and then having to scan it and attach it to the electronically filed return or do the separate transmission of attached documents, all of which was kind of a pain. Uh, that, yeah, it's permanent. Well, today we did get H.R. 5376. The Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 was passed by the United States Senate on August the 7th. It did pass on a 51-50 vote after the Votorama. Uh, during the Votorama, there was actually, as I can understand it, a couple of amendments that were adopted. Uh, there was some, again, some more, let's say, you know, lessening the impact of the corporate minimum tax. So there's some adjustments there. I don't have many details on that. I just read essentially a story that tax notes put together quickly. Also, there appears to have been a actually a pair of amendments, an amendment then an amendment to the amendment. But in any event, there's an amendment that's going to create some situations where certain companies that would be subject to the corporate minimum tax would not be subject to it if they go over the income limit due to certain investment partnership investments, as I recall, the quirky rule. Uh, that was passed. It was originally passed and paid for by an extension of the uh, cap on state and local taxes on Schedule A, extending that for one more year. However, it was then amended to get rid of that and then extend. I got to check and see whether it's really two years or it's just we're extending it for one more year and it's now been extended for two years versus when it was supposed to go away. Uh, the loss limitation for overall business losses claimed by a taxpayer, individual taxpayer on the tax return. Uh, 
again, they've they've gone there before to raise money. It doesn't surprise me they would go there this time. Uh, essentially, we are using what were revenue raisers in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and we're using them to plug holes a as we do this. So it's kind of an interesting issue. Now, the big story this week was that there were changes that they agreed to during the week to get Senator Sinema to agree to let it go forward and obviously eventually agree to pass the bill because her vote had to be there for a 5150 vote because there were no Republicans voting for it. Therefore, there could be no Democrats voting against it. And everybody was there. So the tie-breaking vote went to Vice President Harris, who basically pushed it over the top at 5150. So the carried interest provisions, which Senator Sinema had essentially told everybody she uh, was opposed to back with the Build Back Better Act, which got pulled out of that act, but then reappeared because Senator Manchin insisted he wanted to see those. Apparently, Senator Manchin didn't want to see them bad enough to essentially get rid of the entire bill. Therefore, we now have, you know, the carried interest rules are gone. Interesting enough, you may remember, there were similar strict carried interest provisions in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which similarly got pulled late in the game. Certainly, we will say there is a good lobby <laughs> out there to make changes uh, that, that's protecting those who receive carried interest. That seems to go well. As I said, we have reduction of the impact of the corporate minimum tax. Uh, that includes that amendment that Senator Thune got in. That was going to be paid for with the extension of the state and local tax deduction. But now Senator Warner from Virginia threw in another, threw in the chains that now has the loss limitation rule, which as far as I'm concerned, it didn't matter which one of those two they did because I don't see either one of them ever leaving the law. They're going to be used by Congress for things like this to fill the numbers on the spreadsheet so they can say that this bill only cost X dollars or it actually, or in this case, paid down X dollars on the deficit, and we're going to plug it by doing issues like that. So the issue we have is we've extended the 461 loss limitation. The term I've seen in the press is by two years. We're going to have to wait to see what that actually means. Now, this does mean that even though there was a draft version that's been out and circulating, the Wall Street Journal put a copy of it on their website. Uh, Politico had a copy on their website. Tax analysts had a copy this morning of the bill that they had agreed to before the Voterama. We now need to wait and see the real final, final bill, at least one that left the Senate, and then see if the House actually passes this bill. The reports are the House comes back, uh, I believe it will be they come back on the 9th uh, to begin consideration of the bill. They expect to actually vote on the bill this coming Friday. So expect that the bill will be voted on Friday. If it is enacted at that point, then we would expect the president to sign it sometime in the following week. And essentially, we will then have our tax bill for this year. Once we have that, then I'll begin looking at this in a little more detail, uh, kind of look at provisions. I'll probably start looking at provisions. Once we get this bill out of the Senate, I think there's a reasonable chance because these Congress people want to get out of town and start campaigning. Uh, I think there's a reasonable chance that the House is not going to make a change at this point. They're just going to accept what's there and let it go, at which point then they could just finish this up and be done. But again, we'll have to wait till this week to see what goes on, see what happens in that regard. Revenue Procedure 2022-34 was issued on the 29th of July. And as I said, this might not turn out to be terribly uh, relevant. We may have these overridden by changes in the bill, assuming that it gets passed by the House and the president signs it. But we do have, at least until then, the inflation the table released for years beginning in 2022 related to the premium tax credit. Now, remember, this is the percent of your income that's deemed to be the maximum you have to spend, assuming you're willing to take the second least expensive silver cost plan in your in your under your on your exchange that you could get a tax credit once you paid that amount of your combined household income toward providing coverage the tables which if you're watching the video version of this we have on the screen uh, the percentages start at 1.92 percent for household income that's less than 33 percent of the federal poverty level goes up to the top where at more than 300, but no more than 400, it's 9.12%. If the IRA provision is not passed, if, that, if the IRA does not become law, 
then nine point then that forty four hundred percent of the poverty level is the maximum level at which you could qualify for a credit. What the IRA has in it, I'm now pretty sure they haven't touched this one, would essentially no longer have that four hundred percent cap. We would get to a top level which would be lower than nine point one two percent. I believe it's around eight percent. And that would then apply to everybody. Now, again, unlikely Warren Buffett is going to qualify. In theory, Warren could. But I have a feeling the second lowest cost silver plan in Omaha is likely that would cover Warren. Well, first thing is he's under Medicare, but let's assume he wasn't. Uh, I would probably guess the second lowest cost plan would be would cost him significantly less than eight, you know, than 8.1% 8.1% or 9.12% of his household income. So my guess is don't worry about that, but it does get rid of the cliff. I happen to, my own theory, as I think I've said before, is I like getting rid of cliffs. Uh, we can talk about the policy issue all you want. This credit, should it be there? What's its point? But I do think it is very, very bad just way of running a tax system when you have these super cliffs where a benefit exists and then suddenly there is this huge cost with $1 of income taking you over the magic cliff level. So again, we'll see if that's there. Finally, we also get the employer uh, employer plan required contribution percentage. The, this is where the employer, as long as they offer uh, coverage, that's no more than this percent of income. For the taxpayer, single coverage, and that's whether that's going to stay single or not is still up in the air. There's proposed regs on that, but let's say for now it's still single. As long as that's no more than 9.12% of the employee's income, if you use the safe harbor, you use W 2 wages, as long as you're not asking for more than that, you're considered to have made an offer of affordable coverage. As long as that offers minimum essential care, uh, essentially you can kind of bypass the nastier version of the. Uh, penalty of the shared responsibility, pe- uh, basically tax that's imposed on an employer that doesn't offer affordable coverage to over 95% of their employees. So anyway, that'll be 9.12 next year. We also got this week the draft 2022 form 1040. Well, actually, it was last week on the 29th, but we got it. We actually got a look at it in details from the website. Got it brought forward, so we got to look at it this week. And this question relates to, remember, the virtual currency question. We had it first in 2019 on Schedule 1 of Form 1040. Then it moved for two years with effectively the same question. But then just moved to the front page of Form 1040. For 2022's return, it will be still on the front page of Form 1040. But there are a couple of significant changes. We're going to have some more detailed questions asked about ways you could have received uh, these at these assets uh, in conceivably taxable or even potentially non-taxable manners, as well as, you know, basically, we're going to change the term used. It will no longer be called virtual currency there. They're going to talk about digital assets. So the actual question is here at any time during 2022, did you, and this is kind of a two-part question, A, receive as a reward, award, or compensation, or B, sell, exchange, gift, or otherwise uh, dispose of a digital asset, or financial interest in a digital asset, C, instructions. Now, a couple of things there. First thing is they make it much clearer on receiving because the original question was criticized for seeming like you just had to report buying it. Did you receive it as a reward, award, or compensation, all of which are potentially taxable? And then they're also going to ask you, did you sell, exchange, gifts, or otherwise dispose of? Now, obviously, sale, exchanges, and most other dispositions would be taxable, but a gift would not be a taxable transaction but I suspect the question may arise if you've been gifting these virtual currencies, uh, where'd you get them? You know, basically things like that. Also, there may be gift tax return issues. In any event, the question is going to be different. So if you're working on your, let's say, client organizers, client letters for next year, you may want to, you know, point out the revised questions and the fact they're asking for a bit more. They want to know a bit more details about certain ways of receiving it that are potentially taxable also certain ways of disposing of it. And we've changed from virtual currency to virtual asset. 
Now, that is the language that was used at the end of the year at the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act. They, you know, when they added the reporting that will start here short, they'll start, I believe it's after the end of next year, we start the reporting. Uh, when we start reporting at that point, that's going to be digital assets. It won't just be virtual currencies. Uh, it will include things like non-fungible tokens or whatever the blockchain du jour asset is at that point in time would be included and covered under the category of digital assets. So it's broader. If clients have been trading NFTs, at this point they probably lost a fortune if they have. But if they have been, yes, it's going to become clear now that, yes, that's also on the list. Next up, the case of Redleaf versus Commissioner. Now, this is a Sixth Circuit case, and these are two cases because it's a divorce case. And in a divorce issue over alimony, the IRS is going to effectively, you know, go ahead and haul into court both the payor and the recipient. Because even though the IRS now agrees that the recipient probably shouldn't pay tax on this, if the court decides that the payor should get a deduction, well, the IRS preserves their right to collect the tax from the recipient spouse. So these are cases number 21-2209 and 21-2224. The Sixth Circuit came down with this decision on August the 5th. Now, the amounts in this case are fairly significant. We're looking at, in total, $51 million worth of payments made from, you know, made from Mr. Redfern to his former spouse. So he's claiming these are deductible payments, right? Now, the problem we have in this case, if you take a look at the case, and let's talk first about, you have to remember, under the law before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which still applies to pre-2019 divorce agreements, if there are payments coming from one spouse to another, they might be deductible alimony. But we're not going to really take a look initially at state law because we don't care if state law calls it alimony, calls it maintenance, calls it, you know, payments for pink elephants. We don't really care what it's called. What we care about is four criteria. If those four criteria are met, then the payment is going to be ruled to be alimony deductible to the payee under Section 215A and includable in income under Section 71B1, the former 71B1, uh, deductible and includable as income by the recipient. Now, two of the requirements are not usually a problem. First, it's got to be received by or on behalf of a spouse under a divorce or separation instrument. Bingo. We tend to have that, and these, that's not a problem in these cases. Can be if you've got some sort of informal arrangement, that's not going to work, but not usually a problem. And also, in the case of an individual legally separated from his spouse under a degree of divorce or separate maintenance, the spouse, the payee, and the payor are not members of the same household at the time such payment is made. Obviously, in many cases, if the parties are battling actively, the last thing they're going to want to do is share a household with the other party. So I haven't ever found that the spouses are still living in the same household. So that one also is usually not our problem. The problems come in what are the second and third options that are found here for alimony under Section 71's definition. Now, the first issue here is if the divorce or separation instrument does not designate such a payment as a payment which is not includable in gross income under this section and not allowable as a deduction under Section 215. Now, that's the provision that a recipient is going to want to use if the recipient is going to take the position or wants to take the position that the payments are not alimony. If I can get the payments, you know, if I can get the paying spouse, right, to sign off on the divorce decree, or even the judge forces it, maybe, if that statement's in there, then I know I don't pay tax on it, period. That one is absolute. That one by itself definitely can structure it as not taxable alimony. That is one that you would expect a recipient spouse's counsel and the spouse might insist on being in the agreement, assuming the recipient is going to take the position, as the spouse did in this case, 
that, you know, the, the payee spouse that this is not taxable alimony. Well, we'll talk about maybe why you wouldn't. That's a whole other issue, but that's there. The other half of this is that you also have to establish there's no liability to make any such payment for any period after the death of the pay spouse. And there's no liability to make any payment in cash or property as a substitute for such payment after the death of the pay spouse. Now, this is a provision that if I am the pay spouse and my counsel, we would prefer to have that in the document. Talk about this stream of payments and just say, you know, if, you know, if my former spouse passes away, you know, these payments stop. You know, regardless of the fact we're saying we're going to pay these at this rate on these dates over the next five years, if my former spouse dies before all those payments are made, any payments not yet made would no longer be required. So that's got to be one of the issues to be alimony. So you'd think you'd put that in the document. Well, Congress enacted these four rules back in 1984 because they got tired of trying to interpret state law, figure out what was alimony. Because, again, you know, it's not become in vogue to call it alimony since the 60s or so. So quite often you have something that looks a lot like it, but it's called something different. And so, or you have things that also, like in Florida, I remember the case a few years ago, of something called lump sum alimony that looks a lot more like property settlement. So it's like, you know, they got so forget it. We're not going to try to figure this out. We are simply going to say, here's the four criteria. We do not care what the state calls it. These are our four criteria. We're there. Now, as I said, one of the problems we have is you would think that since we have a way to make sure it's not alimony, right, by simply having it say it's not, and since the other two requirements aren't really an issue, then the flip side of it is if I then can get something included in the document that says the payment stop. If the, you know, if my former spouse dies, the payments immediately, my liability immediately stopped for any payments that remain to be paid. You would think that we shouldn't have fights over alimony, right? That in the divorces, the counselor should, you know, include the language to make it very clear which way this goes. Well, the problem is it doesn't usually happen that way. Well, let's talk about this case, because again, in this case, it didn't happen that way. Now. In this case, Andrew, who was a payor spouse, uh, you know, he in, in the divorce, he received a little bit of property, three pieces of art, his personal effects, the fifth vehicle. I guess I guess she gets four vehicles. So it was kind of interesting. I, I, guess, well, I guess I guess you rotate them during the week. I don't know. You got four of them anyway. And most importantly, in this case, the entire 84.5% ownership interest in White Box Advisors, LLC, a hedge fund management firm that he had founded. Right. Obviously, that was the hugely valuable asset in this mix. So, you know, she got the houses. She got some other assets. But there's this thing that's worth a lot of money. And obviously, he's going to get it. So she's going to be compensated for that. And so the actual divorce, the actual agreement said, in a section entitled Property Settlement, provided that Andrew would pay Elizabeth $140 million over the next five years. That he would first pay $750,000 on or before February 15th of $750,000. He'd pay a second one by the same date of $20 million, right? He would pay her a million five per month for 60 months. And in March of 2013, he would pay her $30 million. Now, as of the point these cases are involved, we have $51 million of these payments that are currently what's before the court. The question is, are these payments? Now, you might immediately say, wait, wait, wait. It says it's property settlement, right? It can't be alimony. Game, set, match. Andrew cannot possibly win this. The problem is the law is not nearly that simple. The problem is that what the law tells us in this case was even though the state law indicates that this was a property settlement, it doesn't mean it necessarily will be, right? You know, what it tells us is it doesn't have any of those terms. Now, it did have a few other terms. You know, it told us that Elizabeth is not employed outside the home. She has adequate income and financial resources from the property settlement to meet her needs and the needs of the minor child when she is in her care. 
It also provided that each party is capable of self-support, and they both waive rights, receive temporary and or permanent spousal maintenance, now or in the future. The consideration for said waivers is a property division, as described in the document. The award of income-producing assets and both parties' ability to provide adequate self-support after considering the standard of living established in the marriage. The parties intended to vest the court of jurisdiction to award spousal maintenance to either party now or in the future. And it says the parties entered into the division of property intending to be equitable division of marital property, which they believe to be co-owned by virtue of the actual contributions of each party, the acquisition of the whole, and the virtue of the co-ownership uh, property interest granted to spouses by law. Both spouses accordingly agree not to take any position, which is inconsistent with the concept of an equitable division of jointly owned property with regard to any filing, audit, or report required by any state or federal taxing authority. And then finally, it says, it's the it, part six listed terms shall be incorporated in judgment decree. And that included a section on spousal maintenance where it says that he will pay no temporary permanent spousal maintenance to her. Elizabeth having absolutely waived the right to have Andrew pay permanent temporary spousal maintenance in the future. And the court is divested of and shall have no jurisdiction over spousal maintenance, thereby bringing the court from modifying the party's agreement at a later date as this white right was waived pursuant to various Minnesota statutes and the case of Karen versus Karen. And Andrew is awarded in the business interest all right, title, interest, and equity in and to white box. Uh, she waives all right to interest she may have in the business, including white box. So now let's get to how the court looked at this, right? So the problem you may notice is the agreement did not specifically deal with, you know, is this or is this not considered alimony? And it didn't, so it had nothing explicitly that said it was not taxable, nor that it was not considered includable in income. And it had nothing that said if these payments would continue should Elizabeth die. Would Andrew have to keep making these payments to her estate or her heirs? So now we get into this fight. Now the court kind of took a dig at counsel for the parties here, stating, quote, rather surprisingly, given the overall sophistication of the document and substantial state court litiga litigation between the parties that followed, this, this MTA, which was the Marital Termination Agreement, contained no provision clarifying or designating that the payments in question were not included in Elizabeth's gross income and out liable to the deduction to Andrew, and no provision unambiguously stating that Andrew had no liability to make payments for a period after Elizabeth's death. So they're saying, look, you botched the two things you needed to get right. Now, we see this quite a bit. I've seen courts make this comments before, too, like this case should never have been before the court because there just shouldn't be an issue here, right? In essence, we gave you the tool to solve this problem. Well, okay, why isn't this in this agreement? Well, I suppose it could simply be that all parties, including counsel representing each parties, were unaware of these rules. Uh, in, a, in a case with, shall we say, where the numbers aren't quite as big, and especially ones that are pro se, you know, where the parties just represent themselves in divorce, I, I can buy that a little better. I can buy it probably, too, with certain ones. But again, you'd think with a sophisticated case like this, that we'd be dealing with attorneys and law firms that are probably going to have tax counsel around or they'll bring tax counsel in. So why would you leave this off? Well, I think a couple of reasons are why we see it, even if, even if counsel is very aware that this could be solved. The first problem is what the court already said. There's been a lot of litigation and long negotiations. This has cost a lot of money to date to get to the point where they finally got an agreement. If you throw this issue of who's going to pay tax or who's going to get a deduction on the table, that's probably going to add and create more negotiations, longer litigation, and more time at the state. My guess is that counsel may want to simplify and get this done. We've been doing it long enough. Number two, it is very possible that either or both counsel might believe that because remember, if it's silent, we're going to discover we go to state law. And both might believe that state law would support their position. That, for instance, and probably not over whether it's automatically not alimony, although that was actually argued 
by Elizabeth, and the tax court even kind of went along with that, but the Sixth Circuit decided they didn't have to deal with it, so they didn't. Or the Eighth Circuit, I should say. I think it was, yeah, whichever. Uh, so what they said was, look, we're not going to deal with that. So they looked at the second thing, which is, were these payments, did they terminate at Elizabeth's death? Because if they don't do that, it's not alimony and we're done. Only if they would terminate, we have to figure out if the language in the agreement means or effectively says she's not taxable. Now, the tax court has recently had a couple of cases like this where they have taken statements of the sort you see in this one and actually use them to indicate, well, it's clear this meant the intent is it wouldn't be taxable. And I suspect they're going to latch on to that one about equal division of property and taking no position inconsistent with that when through, you know, for purposes of a taxing authority. My guess is that's really where they're saying, yep, there it's specified. But, you know, in this case, the appellate court didn't really want to go there. So what the appellate court was looked at, okay, do these payments terminate at death? Now, as the court points out, you basically go through three things. First, we're going to determine if payments are alimony and do they terminate at the pay's death. The first thing we do is look for explicit, unambiguous language in the decree, in the divorce agreement. If that exists, that's controls, and we have our answer. Both parties and the IRS, everybody agrees, the court agrees, the parties do, that there is nothing in this agreement that unambiguously says payments would or wouldn't cease at Elizabeth's death. So the second thing you then test is if there is no unambiguous termination provision, then the court looks to where the payments would terminate at the pay's death by operation of state law. In essence, does state law give us a clear answer that under this agreement the payments would terminate? If the state law is also ambiguous, then they say the court then looks solely to divorce instrument to determine where the payments terminate the pays death. Now, that third category would be really bad because what they're going to say is we're going to then decide there because it keeps saying she gets no maintenance and it says these are property settlements. Well, yeah, that would go against him. So obviously his main argument is that these are prop that these are essentially maintenance payments under Minnesota law because maintenance payments under Minnesota law clearly terminate when the spouse dies everything else is considered contractual and contractual arrangements you still have to pay to the estate or whoever unless the contract says you don't have to and this one doesn't so he says well he tried to argue that that these were in fact maintenance payments right uh, now, under the law in Minnesota, and Minnesota is the state that had jurisdiction here, the county court could only grant a maintenance order if either Elizabeth lacked sufficient property, including marital property apportioned to her, to provide for reasonable needs of the spouse considering her standard of living established during the marriage. And he agrees he can't show that because the decree concedes that. So number two, if she's unable to provide self-support after considering the standard of living established during the marriage and all relevant circumstances. Now, he says that's the one right there, that, that one. He says tens of millions of dollars were needed to self-support her, quote, extravagant international lifestyle established during the marriage and further enhance in the years after their divorce. That she's spending money left and right. And in order to spend money left or right, you need to have money left or right. And so, therefore, there was a justifiable need to have maintenance. Now, the panel didn't agree. He says, you know, what the panel says is under Minnesota law, you have to sh have a showing of need in order to do this. Right? You have to have that. If there is no showing, showing of need, then you can't do it. When there is the equal division of property, and which enabled the person to maintain their standard of living, there can be no maintenance awarded. Because the agreement concedes that, you know, remember it conceded that. They're saying, look, there could not have been this. So this payment stream, whatever it is, cannot be alimony because it would continue after she dies. Since it would consider continue after her death, be payable to her estate or heirs, it's not alimony, right? So they're unrelated to the support of the recipient. 
And in any event, they also pointed out that we actually have a Minnesota court that ruled on this. Turns out life wasn't so great in the hedge fund world after the 2008 financial crisis, right? That it negatively affected his company, and he said he could not continue to make the $1.5 million monthly payments, and he went to court to try to get that reduced. We may remember that they all agreed the courts couldn't touch these things. I suspect because he thought he was going to be doing much better. Now he does much worse. He's trying to get it reduced down. And there, you know, and again, he tries to argue that, that this was support. And the court said, it was kind of funny, you know, what, what they said there, the court said, the court said the loss is how one can construe the property of somebody's spousal maintenance, given the clear language in the paragraph 17 and 19 of the decree. And the Minnesota Court of Appeals affirmed this, right? Uh, you know, because essentially she was entitled to one half of the value of white box. There was no question of that. In lieu of establish the value based on appraisal of business, she agreed to his proposed cash settlement without any reference to white box. And because of that, the court said that's clearly you agreed it's property settlement. So, you know, it's not maintenance. Having been agreed it's not maintenance, the court having found it had to be maintenance in order for the payments to stop at her death, it was ruled not to be alimony. Now, as I said, be careful here. These days, we're not going to be involved in planning anymore. It used to be we're talking about getting involved if your client's getting divorced to make sure this issue is raised. And if, if we're going to ignore it, we're going to ignore it with our eyes wide open because we don't want to cause trouble, not, not because counsel never realized there was a problem. Now the bigger problem is you're going to get divorce decrees in your hand. My guess is in this case, whichever party you represented in preparing their return, you would have counsel if you asked about these things who would claim that the law clearly establishes that it is or isn't alimony. Now you might have to explain the tax law. And by the way, hint, if you have to actually explain the tax law to the counsel, it's probably not the payment they think it is. <laughs> Hopefully, they, they know the rules. They can explain right away why that language is in the agreement. But be careful. Don't take and don't just take counsel's word. Because, again, and especially counsel probably who you know are dealing with things that are somewhat smaller than $51 million payment streams, you know, traditional little small divorces, may or may not be up to speed on the tax law, but it's irrelevant. They will immediately claim they are not tax experts, right? You are a tax expert. That's what you sell. You understand the test here is not what Arizona calls it. That, that's the other big thing to worry about. You know, if, if they come back in and say, well, Arizona or New Jersey or Minnesota or Nevada, you know, they, they say it's this. And so that's what is. Nope, this is a federal law test. We do have, you know, federal government, state government. The taxes are a federal issue, so federal laws matter, and we have a federal definition of alimony, and that's what we're looking at. You need to take your agreement and check against that. Be very, very careful. This also can become a problem and why I get really worried when people want to keep doing both spouses' returns, you know, when during a divorce and after a divorce. This has also been a problem because, you know, just taking counsel's word for it is or is an alimony, you've got to make a call and if it's a case like this where you maybe arguably it's not clear and their counsels disagree, I would say it'd be virtually impossible to do both returns. You know, you just have a major problem trying to do that. Finally, th this week, we have one more thing to look at. And that is, yeah, we got that. We have Treasury Decision 9963 on, a on August the 4th. This is an election. This is the election under 754 to adjust the basis of partnership assets on the triggering of certain occurrences. It could be under 743, which is when there's a transfer of a partnership interest. Could be at death, right? Or when there is a transfer, let's say, by a sale of the interest. And that's what most people think a 74 election is related to. But it's also true that 734, when, it, when there is certain distributions of property from a partnership, also can trigger this. And the, there are various ways it could happen. It generally gets triggered whenever a gain or a loss is recognized by the receiving partner or the receiving partner takes a basis 
in an asset received that is different than the basis in the partnership. And it's a long explanation about when all of those situations can occur. That's why you have advanced partnership courses you should be taking. But skipping that for right now, that's also a case where we have a basis adjustment under 734. 74 elections are basically once you make them, they can only be unmade if you meet the terms of the IRS requirements to unmake them which generally requires a significant change in ownership. There are some other ways to show it, but it's difficult. Oh, by the way, if you're going to undo one, you have to undo it essentially by the end of the month following the end of the tax year that you want to undo it for. So it's something like kind of a January call for a calendar year partnership to, un to try to undo it. Now, the catch is that election has to be attached to return, and it, is, it stays enforced, you know, essentially for every year thereafter, for every other transfer, which could go against the taxpayers in some case, because sometimes, yeah, everything was worth more and more and more. And then remember 2008 and our, you know, our friend there, the Red Leaf case, uh, you know, suddenly his hedge fund became worth much less, same issues there, and suddenly the acquiring partners are getting negative adjustments, which they might not be so thrilled about. So anyway but it does keep requiring. Now, previously, that election had to have certain statements in it, which is still true, and this is what the reg changes. But it also had to be have a pen and paper signature. You know, so a wet signature would be the term. We had to have a signature in that case. In 2017, the IRS issued proposed regulations on which taxpayers could rely that removed the signature requirement. The reason for that was because of that pen and ink signature requirement complicated electronically filing partnership returns, and the IRS decided that was unnecessary. They already had a you know electronic signature via the system used for signing the partnership return electronically. They decided there really was no need for that signature on the election form, so they got rid of it, and then they asked for comments. Now, it's tough to explain why I suspect COVID got in the way. But in any event, although realistically, COVID wasn't until three years after, you know, it wasn't like till well over two years after this was released in late 2017. So I can't explain why during those two years they hadn't finalized it. But we have just now in 2022, five years later, finalized the regs. They got no comments. They're exactly the way the proposed regs were. So the thing to remember about all of this is it's now permanent. Also, if you didn't know signatures weren't required, they're not required. So you can just make the election. Your software should have that built in now, should be able to be made in the software for the 74 election. So be aware of that. This has been the Current Federal Tax Developments for the week of August the 8th, 2022. Current Federal Developments are brought to you, as always, by CAP Financial Education and by your State Society of CPAs. Uh, if you have any questions, my email address, edzollers at currentfordexdevelopments.com. You also can find me on the uh, Connect sites for Arizona, New Jersey, Minnesota, Illinois, and Washington I check in on. I also check in on the uh, anything that goes up on the board for Idaho, so you can watch there. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, hopefully you're getting through your extension returns now. We're now down to, you know, we're heading down the stretch. You're going to start hitting ultimate deadlines in just over a month, right? The first the pass-throughs come September 15th, and then everybody else comes. It'll all be fun. So in any event, get all that going, heading up to October 15th. And then, voila, you know, we, we get a whole, you know, what is it, two and a half months, quote, off. Not really, because tax planning should be taken care of in that point. And then we start the whole thing all over again. So anyway, great fun. Uh, we'll see you next week. If we actually have a bill, I'll probably be discussing what's in that bill in a little more detail. You know, the, ta the energy credits are probably the biggest thing, I think. Energy credits and the premium tax credits are probably the things that's going to affect most of the people on this, on this broadcast. I suspect most of you are not dealing with corporations that over the past three years have averaged over a billion dollars of income. Uh, there may be a few of you listening, and fine. Hi, you're there. Hopefully, you've been keeping up with this because that's really important for you guys. Uh, but otherwise, we're probably going to have the other parts I'll spend more time on than the corporate minimum tax. So we'll, we'll take a look from there. But otherwise, have a good week, and we will see you next week with more current federal tax developments. <laughs>